welcome to another episode of the podcast. This is your proprietor, Tony Ortega, coming to you from an undisclosed location deep inside the interior of the Earth's crust, otherwise known as the Underground Bunker. One of the people we were happy to see in Los Angeles when we were covering the Danny Masterson trial was our old friend Tori Chrisman. We first wrote about Tori back in 2001, and she's still one of our absolute favorite people in the world. And wow, she let us get into some things we'd kept under our belt for a long time, as you will see. Well, here we are on Christmas Eve at the Underground Bunker, and wow, what a treat. Tori Chrisman has joined <laughs> us today for the podcast. How are you, Tori? Hey, I'm doing very well, and hello to you, Tony. I thank you for everything you're doing and all the Underground Bunker. Well, gosh, we go back a ways, don't we, Tori? <laughs> you were my very first interview that I ever did, and as you remember, I was scared to death. I mean, I was really terrified at that time in 2000. That was, yeah. I, 2000 or was it 2001? I think uh, the story came out in 2001. I think it was right at the end of the year, too, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And so it was 21 years ago. Wow. Let me give a little background on that and sure. we can talk about it and then and then we'll bring it up to the present time. But I I had started writing about Scientology in Phoenix, but then I had moved over to New Times Los Angeles. And uh, I was I had written uh Graham Barry, a, a Graham Barry story. And uh and so at that point I was kind of plugged into what was going on online. And then you made this spectacular defection from Scientology live on ARS, which was the main nexus of Scientology news in those days. And I immediately realized it was a great story, but <laughs> I didn't know if I was ever going to get it. Um, but finally uh, you decided to talk to me. We got to, I think, didn't I meet you in like Burbank or something at a restaurant? Yeah, I met you at the Black Angus because they have yeah. those those big booths where nobody could see us because I was afraid Osa would be coming and recording us. So, and this was, I, I've explained to people why this was such a significant story to me because my first story about Scientology in 1995 was about Rick Ross, who was a, a deprogrammer. Um, my next really big story, uh, oh, then the story after that was about Jeff Jacobson, who was a very prominent protester at that time. Right. Uh, who was never in. And then the story after that was about Graham Barry, who was a really interesting attorney. So I had written about these people who were around Scientology, but this your story was the first one that I really got to dig into what, what it was like for a person to join Scientology, be in it for a long time, and then make that really difficult decision to leave. And right. so for me, it was really important to learn what you had been through um, and so it meant a lot to me, but also you at the time, yeah, you were terrified about it coming out. So, yeah. and then just to give a little more background, what made her, you know, Tori's story so amazing was that part of the reason she was able to leave Scientology was that she had run into Andreas Heldahl Lund, the operator of Xenu.net, and he had turned out to be very helpful and, and, and caring with her and it really blew her mind. And so this was what the story I wrote was about was I, I interviewed Tori, I interviewed Andreas and told about the remarkable move you made from someone who was online attacking the critics of Scientology and then became a critic yourself. Uh, I mean, it still blows me away that I got to do that story, Tori. <laughs> it was a pretty amazing time. It really was. You know, it's, it's hard. I want to clarify a couple of things. The first two guys that you did the interviews with, as wonderful as they are, they were never members. So right. so for people listening, everyone, most people that are listening to this have been on the Internet for years and years and years. But when I got in Scientology, there was no Internet. So people all the time say to me, I would never do that. And I say, of course, I would never do it either if I had the information you have that you just think everyone has, but we didn't have it. I got in Scientology in 1969, which is before most people listening to this were even a thought in your parents' minds, let alone born. 
<laughs> I mean, some people may be my age, but a lot of people aren't. So there was no internet. So there was no way to get access to this kind of information. There was no internet. There was no, let's pull up Tony and hear what he has to say today. You know, it was all, it was a whole different thing. So anyway, I just wanted to mention that because that's the thing that a lot of times people, they just can't understand how could someone be so brainwashed. And also that Scientology is a, a form of mind control. It is. And so Tony, it was just so scary at, at one point to meet him because he was a journalist and Scientologists are totally against journalists. You know, they, they build it in from early, early on. Don't ever talk to journalists, right? And Tony was a journalist. And I was like, oh, God. You know, I was not only out of Scientology, but now I'm going to make a report about it, which, you know, I'm going to talk about it. So anyway, go on. That's it. No, I mean, well, uh, the other thing I want to bring up is, you know, when you joined in 1969, one of the things you told me that really struck me was that, you know, even at only 18 years old, you had a very strong sense of of civil liberties and freedom of speech. And right. and you you joined thinking that this organization shared those values, but then when you got out, was it San Francisco you ended up at in first or was it LA? You went out to no, what happened is, first of all, Scientology is like a triangle. And so everyone gets in at the bottom, right? And then you slowly work your way up to the top. And by the time Tony met me, I had been at the next to the top level of Scientology. So that's kind of key to all of this because I knew all the secret information that a lot of other people never even see. People read about it and think everyone in Scientology knows about it, but that's not true. It's, again, like a triangle, and you only find out about these top secret things way at the top, you know, the top triangle. So um, I know. I'm just asking you. What, you told me that you came out from the Midwest, and was it either San Francisco or Los Angeles? I can't remember. Well, it was in L. It was I, I was in college, and I read Dianetics, and I quit college and hitchhiked in 1969 from Chicago to L.A. L.A. Okay. Because on the on the back of the Dianetics book, it said Saint Hill, England, or American Saint Hill in L.A. Right. No. What I what I remember from our story was you telling me that you had this background of a free spirit and 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 you know you really believed in freedom of speech and that kind of thing and you thought that you know scientology might help you with that you got to la and i remember you telling me you saw these big portraits of l ron hubbard everywhere right and you were like uh wait a minute <laughs> <Yeah. coughs> and it kind of reminded you of like uh mao you know and it was like what, what's what kind of an organization is going to have these big portraits of this guy everywhere i thought that right. was really funny that you kind of had that immediate sort of uh question but then you got into it fully and like you said you got way up on the pyramid you got very high up and um and then you had this spectacular defection uh thanks to well in part thanks to andreas held lund giving you this information what i loved about that whole thing was what was going on at the time was there was this uh place on the usenet called uh, Alt Religion Scientology, ARS. And it was the place to be in 1999, 2000, 2001 for information about Scientology. And Tori, you were attacking the critics there. Um, but w the reason why Andreas reached out to you was you were doing a lot of reply all stuff that was just making your posts very large and unwieldy. And he basically reached out to say, listen, if you you know, we want to hear your arguments, but you should, you know, make, he was basically telling you how to make your arguments better. And this just completely shocked you because Andreas Haldal Lund ran Operation Clambake. He was the devil. And here the devil was helping you out. Right, exactly. Well, a little bit of background on that, that I don't know that if you know, but I, I, again, being in this triangle, I had gotten onto their second, the top level OT7 and it didn't work for me. And so for seven years, I was like struggling along, trying to make it work. And I had these massive migraine headaches. So I finally started going to bookstores and reading self-improvement books for 10 years. And in that time, I think I stripped off a lot of brainwashing 
because it was just stuff. It got me to think, which that's part of getting you up that triangle by the top. I couldn't think at all because anyway, that's too long a story. But the the ten the ten years of reading those self improvement books, and then I got on the internet. I wasn't attacking the critics. That's that's not correct. I opened the phony accounts, and Bill Yachty was Bill Yachty was my auditor or counselor. And also at the time, I thought my best friend. And he said, look, you know, there's a lot of evil people on the Internet. We just need to handle it. You open these accounts and I'll do the rest. Okay. And I was like, OK, what are you going to do? And he said, I'm not going to tell you because they're really evil and they'll get you in deposition and keep you there for years. So just, you know, open the accounts and I'll do the rest. So he did all this stuff online. I did finally realize they were stopping free speech. And so I kind of disconnected from him and OSA. And I went on ARS myself and made 4,000 posts in four, in two, I think in two weeks, I made 4,000 posts. And, and, you know, but they weren't anything attacking anybody because I was too afraid to read anything on the internet. Cause he, uh -huh. one of my friends went insane and Nancy Maney, and she's written a book about it, and they actually drugged her and reverse audited her, but I didn't know that. And so I thought that she just went insane. And he said that, yeah, she went insane because, and she didn't go insane, but she went crazy for a little bit. Now she's fine and, you know, great and been helping people. And anyway, I, I just wanted to make that clear that she's, she, it was a brief period but anyway, he said that's because she was reading the Internet. So I was like totally terrified to read the Internet. But I was I, I had opened the accounts that he was attacking the critics with. OK, but, but what was Andreas helping you with? So I was making these 4000 posts because I just felt like if I, I, I you have to realize Scientology had sent me out to handle, quote unquote, get rid of the critics picketing for two years. And so for all those two years, every time I'd be out there, they'd be saying these facts about L. Ron Hubbard and the church and different things. And I just had up this plexiglass, right? But now I was starting to wake up. I, so I wouldn't hear anything they said. But now I was starting to wake up and I thought, maybe they know something I don't know. I better go on there. But I was too afraid to read what they were writing. So I was just on there making these stupid posts. And, and I would read a little bit, like their title, and then I would write something. And I only knew how to copy paste. So Andreas sent me an email and said, look, no one can understand what you're saying. Because <laughs> between like Tony and I right now, Tony says something on the internet at that time, you, there'd be all these little arrows between what I would say. So you could tell it's Tony, it's Tori, it's Tony, it's Tori, right? So I thought when I copy pasted, I thought, who needs all these arrows? So I erased all the arrows and I would just paste it. And so he said, you don't know how to format. And I didn't even know what the word format meant. And so I said, no, I don't. And he goes, all right, well, I'm going to send you a link showing you how to format. And he did. Mm. And so that that was what the it does it sounds like nothing but it was so major that this evil horrible sp that i thought was a devil and the worst person on the planet actually helped me yeah. and yeah. i sent him a little thank you note and at the end again i thought he'd write me some horrible thing saying how awful you are and instead he said you're welcome andreas heldelin and he had his whole phone number, his address, his cell phone number. And that was what blew my mind because we were using phony names, phony addresses, phony everything, right? Because they were afraid that they would be traced back to the Church of Scientology. Wow. And what he said was, I believe in truth. I believe in looking at both sides and I have the courage to say what I think. I don't think Scientologists are bad. I just think they're misinformed. And that was really what cracked what I call the Scientology Truman Show, because it was just like I, it just cracked everything open because I thought that is who I was when I joined Scientology, just like you're saying, Tony. 
but now I was at the top of this triangle and I couldn't I couldn't read anything, I couldn't look at anything. I mean, they're totally isolated, insulated, and it's just awful. So it was the first time someone said that to me and I went, Oh God, you know, it's true. Well, it's a wonderful story, <clears throat> and um, uh, I've gotten to know the two of you since then, and I was just in L.A., and we got together, Tori, right? I know. I it know. So nice. It was so nice. It's just been such a wonderful friendship, and and you have been so great. I mean, I used to say when I was in the church, if anyone would just write every day what goes on in this church they could be known around the world, you know, because it would be huge. And, of course, nobody did for a long, long time because they were really afraid that they'd get sued. But anyway, everything changed. Obviously, 2008, Anonymous arrived, took on the church, and that sort of really opened up the media lines because, you know, they, they couldn't sue all these Anonymous people. They were all in masks. Nobody knew who they were. You know, we did a picket. There were 9,000 people that day around the world in every major city. And I think they realized they were just, they couldn't sue everybody. They just couldn't. And so the media sort of, who had been interviewing me for eight years, but it was all, you were the only person who really heard my story in 2000. You were the first person and the only person for eight years. I mean, the other people, I would tell my story, but they would never post it. They would post, you know, because it was more TV. And they would post or radio, you know, and they would, but not, that was mostly TV. And they would edit it, and it would be mostly Tom Cruise or one yeah. of their celebrities and right. two seconds of me. But you were the first person and only person until 2008 that really told my story. And thank well, you. And, that, well, sure. And then, and then you also took to YouTube, and you've put out right. so many videos. And I think one of the things that you've done so well is help people understand what it's like to be in. <laughs> yeah, I tried to, I, you know, the ironic thing is that when I left, I still did not believe they did all this bad stuff. I really didn't. Oh, and wow. until they canceled my van going to the airport and then they canceled, the plane was canceled. And I said, can John Travolta cancel a plane? And the person who was helping me go to Clearwater was Stacy Brooks. And she said, bring a phone. And I said, Stacy, they don't do stuff like that. And back in 2000, people only had little emergency phones. They didn't all walk around with their cell phones. So I brought my little emergency phone. And the, the vice president of Scientology was there saying, you know, we know where you're going. You know, you can't go there. And I opened up my flip phone and called Stacy and said, they're here at LAX. You know, it really freaked me out. So making those videos, tell me, you know, what's that experience been like for you? You mean my YouTube videos? Yeah. Well, first of all, I wasn't going to say anything, like I said. And so that's, I'd never finished that. That was the ironic thing because when I woke up, I, my plan was that I was not going to say a thing. And I called Stacy and I said, look, I'm not going to make videos. I'm not going to pick it. I'm not going to say anything. I'm just leaving under the radar. And she said, that's fine. We're just doing what we wish someone had done for us when we left, which, you know, so they gave me a ticket to get out of LA and come to Clearwater because they were helping families. But Scientology just kept picking on me, you know, canceled my van, canceled, the plane was canceled, the vice president was at LAX saying, you know, we know where you're going, you're not going there. They chased me across the country. The Tampa police got me out of the Tampa airport at 1.45 in the morning. So it was a huge, I mean, I, it was so big, I made a 10-part series about my escape that's on Tory, T-O-R-Y, Magoo 44, on YouTube. And so you can just type that in plus escape and it's a 10 part series on all the stuff that happened, but it was huge. And they, they have a thing called fair game, which I didn't believe in at the time, but obviously I do now where they actually attack people that speak out. If you say anything, they speak out. Now they can only do so much. I, I finally realized it because they can't really do big bad things, but they can do enough. Like they flattened all of my tires. 
but they, they do things, you know, they've broken into my house. They stripped all my videos. I had all these videos of my son and friends and family. They stripped all of that to nothing. You know, they've just done awful things to me while I was speaking out. Cause I was like the only, you know, there were like three or four people that were speaking out with our names and our phone numbers. Now I put my phone number up there because I thought there were only 50 people on the internet. I, I had no idea how big the internet was. So it's been monumental to speak out. I mean, I, I only started speaking out because they kept picking on me. And I finally thought, okay, fine. You know, I have free speech too. And I, maybe I have something to say. And I've now made 800 videos about wow. different things, you know. So, I, you know, I had a lot to say. And, and I've said the same thing over and over, but I say it be, and I keep doing it because I'll talk to people who've heard They've heard my story, but they, they don't get it. And then they talk to me and they go, oh, my God, and now I get it. And so I just keep saying the same thing. So people hopefully will get it. And I my policy, I finally realized was, look, if I can help one person not get into the Church of Scientology, it's worth all the shit they throw at me. Can we talk about a celebrity in particular that uh, you and I helped keep out of Scientology? Who was that? I don't know if you want to mention the name or not, but you told me. Oh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. A, um, that a certain celebrity uh, you heard was considering Scientology. It was Roseanne you, Barr, right? Uh, I thought no. No. And that, no, that well, you had you had sent a copy of the story I wrote about you. I know. What was her name? I, her. I just, pardon me? That you, you could say it. A, you sent a copy of the story I wrote about you to her and that that convinced her not to join Scientology. And what was her name? Rosie O'Donnell. Oh, that's it. I knew it was Rose cuz she cuz it was Rosie O'Donnell and she she was on TV, she was interviewing I think Tom Cruise and it was like really getting hot. And and I called my friend who has you know, I won't, you know, she works with celebrities and I said, look, you know, she's, they're getting her. And she said, okay, I'll send her the, your article with Tony, Tony um, Ortega, you know, from the new times LA. So she sent it to her. I got an email that night. This is from Roro. That's why I couldn't remember if Roro was which one. And um, so she sent me that email and I said, look, how do I know you're really Roro? You could be the church of Scientology pretending to be her. And so she she called me. I said, call me. And so she did. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And we talked for about two hours. Really? And I, yeah. And I told her all kinds of stuff. And she called me the next night. She said, I can't thank you enough. They And I, I said, what happened? And she said, well, they, they told me they were going to do this charity event. So I went. And it was in a huge ballroom. It, it was just me and all Scientologists surrounding me. And they were trying to convince me to donate a million dollars. And oh. I probably would have, except oh. I had talked to you the oh, night wow. before. And so I didn't. And she said, I am so mad now. I want to do a show on it. And she wanted to do a TV show on it. And this was way back, you know, when you know, people have to understand nothing was really known that much back then. That, was, that was pre-anonymous. Pardon me? Yeah, it was pre, was... pre-anonymous, right, And which was 2008. So this was way earlier than that. And the media were not speaking out. And I said, well, what do your friends say? And they, she said, what do your family and friends say? And they, she said, they're all saying, don't do it. And I said, you know what? I agree with them. Because the Church of Scientology will come after you and it will be awful. You would be way better to just use your celebrity power and all the people that you know and just tell every single person you know to go see Xenu, X-E-N-U dot net, which was the main website, which was Andreas's website. And it has all kinds of information on it. And she said, okay, deal. That's, that, that'll, that'll work. So that's what happened. Wow, I didn't know those details. Your, yeah, that's because of your your uh, story, Tony. You know, because that helped her. That is amazing. I mean, I, I, you had told me that uh, part of that 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 Rosie O'Donnell 
was thinking about it and that you had sent the article. I did, I don't remember if you told me about the two hour phone conversation. That's amazing. Yeah. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. Because that's always been my thing because people all, Osa all the time would send me phony things saying they were this or that. And I'd say, okay, call me. That's always been my thing. And they will never call. So that that's always my way to find out if it, if it's really them or if it's a real person. So that's why I said to her, okay, if you're Roro, call me. She did. That's great. <laughs> well, see, now it's, it's such a different situation. She should do a show now with, with yeah. you. And, yeah, that uh, would be great, wouldn't yeah, it? Wouldn't that be great? She should. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. And you, we should have you, me, and, and, and Rosie. Because you, I mean, it would be fantastic. And I think she would really enjoy it. But, you know, it's what I'll, I'll talk to my friend and see if we can get it set up. Because, uh, you know, I remember she was known in part for her Tom Cruise obsession, right? Uh -huh. So wouldn't it be fun now for her to do a show basically addressed at Tom? like? Yeah, you know. especially, you know, she and the other person that I would really like to do an interview with is Oprah. Because all the time she says she's against cults, she's against child abuse. You know, but here she is supporting this organization that is supporting Danny Masterson, who is, you know, basically, you know, per, it hasn't been proven, but, you know, we, we've heard the girls' stories and it's it's awful. And, and, and we know that they break up families. I mean, we could have some of the families on where they haven't talked to their children in 30 years. You know, it's like that. It's it's just like how can she support that? But I I get it. You know, it's like me with my plexiglass. You just don't hear it. Yeah, I don't know about Oprah. I mean, she's introduced <laughs> so many questionable characters on the world that she didn't vet properly. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I I don't I don't know that there's any. Well, I'm just saying we can do Rosie. I mean, that would be great if we just did that. That would be great in itself. Yeah, all this time. See, I've known this for so many years, but I never said anything about it publicly because I, I, I'd never really talked to you about it. But I'm glad we're finally getting it out now that uh, you helped keep Rosie O'Donnell out of Scientology. I think that's huge. I think it's pretty huge too. It was a, it was a huge win for me. I mean, I, I've helped a lot of people. I mean, it's, it's been, you know, a lot of stuff I haven't made really public because. People don't want it to be public, and I understand that. But you know what? It, it it's at this age and this time, it's okay. The the way I feel that people can, you know, they can they can come out and talk. And Scientology is, you know, like I. That's why I started that TikTok. TikTok time is on our side because we're telling the truth. They're not. They're trying to stop the truth. So eventually it's going to come out. Like for a long time, I, it was me and four other people speaking out and, and, you know, Tony and, you know, just like a few people that were doing things, but not very many people. And I kept saying, tick tock, tick tock, time is on our side, knowing that somebody was going to speak out. And finally anonymous hit in 2008 and then everything opened up. Nightline came about and, you know, all this stuff with Leah and Mike, that would have never happened without all the stuff that happened, all the critics, you, Tony, you know, your article, your exposures and 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 Nightline and, you know, all the other things because of and also because of Anonymous. You know, things so now things are definitely different today. Very different. Totally yeah. different. They're totally different and wonderful. It's so much better. And and thank you for doing the underground bunker. It's just been such a great thing. It's been so fun to watch you on the videos with with Danny. <laughs> you know, I knew Danny really well, so it's kind of a bummer for me because he he stayed overnight at my house. I mean, when he, he was a kid. Yeah, I mean, I knew him. I taught him when he was two. I taught him in sixth grade. You know, I I knew the kid, and and uh, I feel really bad that. You know, this this happened, I really believe, because of the Church of Scientology, because I watched him kind of evolve into this really snotty celebrity at Celebrity Center. And none of us wanted to even go back there. And we used that used to be home base for us. But it just 
grew into this weird place and I watched him, you know, he was part of it and it was, it was really tragic and I feel bad for him that he, you know, cause his life is ruined forever, no matter whether they find him guilty or not. It, it you know, it's a moot point at this point because the girls have told the stories and you couldn't make those stories up. Well, I mean, let's just be clear for our listeners. Uh, he was tried on three counts of forcible rape that had a potential of putting him in life, uh, put him in prison for life. The jury was hung on all three counts, and so a mistrial was declared. A retrial has been scheduled for March 27. The first hearing, pretrial hearing, is scheduled for January 10. Um, when I spoke to prosecutor... Deputy DA Reinhold Mueller uh, that day of the mistrial, he indicated, you know, he he's looking forward to a retrial, but we're waiting to hear if the DA's office has signed off on that. And they're running out of time. Like, that, like I said, that first hearing is on, on the 10th, which at this point is only, gosh, a little over two weeks away. So, um, yeah, uh, and while it was going, I was out in Los Angeles. I was at the trial, and I got to see you a couple of times, which I was yeah. very happy about. We went, yeah. we had dinner a couple of times, and um, yeah, I mean, it's it's it was a very significant story. And uh, what did you think about um, the sort of Scientology components of it that you, the testimony you were aware of, as far as what these women were told? Uh, you know, that they couldn't use the word rape in Scientology, that they couldn't go to the police. Did this all sound familiar to you? Totally. And see, that as soon as the judge said, there's only three things you can bring into the courtroom about Scientology, I said, it's over. You know, it's, it's like, why even do the trial? Because the key point of this whole thing is how Scientology controls people. And if the jury can't understand that, how deep it goes. And I believe me, I've talked to people, I've made my videos for 22 years. And people still, when they talk to me, they go, oh my God, I never really got that. You know, having heard my videos over and over, people have told me I've listened to them. I, I just never really got it. But they're, they're so awful and so deep the way that it's just, it's deep mind control where you cannot ever call the police. I know another friend of mine, Tommy Gorman, his wife was raped at a mission and Tommy was a public and he went to ethics and said, this lady's getting raped by the supervisor. And they said, Tommy, don't ever say another word about that. And he and his family were in and her family were in and he, Tommy got all of them, put them in a motel, locked the door, made him watch all these videos. They all woke up and left Scientology and he married his wife. He married her. And, you know, but, but that's, that's Scientology. I mean, they're, they're very abusive that way. I mean, they're abusive medically. You know that I have that whole thing because they made me get off my medicine and I had tons of grand mal seizures and my memory screwed up for life because of that. You know, they're very, they have huge abusive things that they do. And if you can't really let the jury know how deep that is and how important it is, how can they possibly make the right decision? They can't. Well, let's, and let's, I, let's just note that um, that particular supervisor who was raping the young girl at, uh, I believe it was San Francisco or did go to prison. Did she? Um, or did he? Yeah. Yeah. He went to prison for that. Good. So, um, I didn't know that. I never heard that. Tony. I didn't and then, know. and then Tommy Gorman would continue to pick at the, um, San Francisco org about it, that they had, they had done the, the Scientology had done nothing about it. Yeah. Like until guy, and Tommy Gorman is a boxer and they came out and hit his hand that he boxes with to the point where he can't box anymore. No, I didn't know about that. Wow. Yeah. And they came out and slammed me in the chest one time. Another time in Ireland, they pushed me down some stairs that were really steep, straight up stairs. And honestly, if John McGee had not caught me, I would have been dead or paralyzed for life. Who who pushed you? Some guy. You know, it was like I what happened was we were they flew me in to speak. A bunch of us, a bunch a bunch of 
quote unquote suppressive people, people who'd been in the church and left. They flew us in for a conference. And I said, let's go see Scientology. I wanted to see the mission there. So we go over there. There's a, a like a sandwich board outside saying, come on in, everyone's welcome, right? And there's a guy standing there with his arms crossed over his chest. And I say, what's up, man? And he goes, nothing. And I said, nothing? And he goes, it's not for everyone. And I said, do you know how out tech that is? Because it's just totally opposite of what you're supposed to do for someone that's helping get people into Scientology. They don't have anything like that. And so he runs inside. And Anonymous was there and they go, she shut him down in under a minute because <laughs> they used to always time how quickly everybody would run away when I would just step on L. Ron Hubbard way. They'd, they'd clear out the entire street within three minutes. And Anonymous would say, she shut him down in three minutes. So now we're in Ireland and they, this guy runs inside. And I thought, screw this. So I go inside and I start going up the stairs and they're really steep stairs. And I go halfway up and I just look at them. They're leaning over the railings. And I said, what are you guys doing? What are you thinking of? And all of a sudden, you know, they said a couple of things. And all of a sudden, this guy from nowhere just came running around the, the, the banister and down the stairs and just shoved me. And I just went flying. And John McGee, thank God, caught me. Wow. Or I honestly would have been paralyzed or dead. You know, it was really spooky. And we called the police, but it's like, you know, what are you going to do? That's always how they are. They they come out, hit you, and then they leave. They hit Tommy and hurt his hand, and then they're gone. Well, and I have my own personal experience with you because I remember – uh, at some point, and I don't know, it was when I was reporting that story in 2001, or maybe it was later, but I was I was with you on Hollywood Boulevard at one point, and we were walking and talking, and we had gotten to the life exhibition, the L. Ron Hubbard life exhibition, which is in the Hollywood Guarantee Building on Hollywood and Ivar, right? Right. And, um, and I, I think uh, you asked me, well, you've been in there, haven't you, Tony? And I said, no, I haven't actually. And she said, well, let's go inside. <laughs> <laughs> and we started to go to the door. And I th- I want to say we got inside the front door. And they just freaked out when they yeah. saw it was you. Yeah. And they told us in no uncertain terms, you're leaving the premises and we're calling the police. Right. And we had to leave. And so that's my only attempt to see that exhibit um, ended very quickly because I happened to be with you. <laughs> I know. I, I Another journalist was interviewing me out in the valley where I live. And you could tell she didn't believe me. You know, it just seemed like too much. And so I said, you know, let's just go to Celebrity Center. I'll I'll show you. You you know, you can see it. So she's a journalist. We get to Celebrity Center. We park the car. She walks onto their property. She goes, oh, that's a nice garden. I said, well, go have a look. So she steps onto the garden and to, you know, this little grassy area. And this guy comes flying out and starts screaming at her, get off our property. And she goes, pardon me? I'm I'm a journalist. And he goes, I don't care what you are. You're with her and she's a declared suppressive. Get off the property. <laughs> <laughs> so we get in the car and I go, let's go to, to the complex. Because I knew they would already have alerted them about me. So she goes, come on. They wouldn't know anything about this. And I said, you watch. And we pull up to the complex. The security guard come driving right up. Get out of here, Tori. You, you're not allowed here. I said, I'm sorry, but this is a public sidewalk and a public street, and we have a right to be on here. And she was like, I can't believe it. I mean, it really, she was freaked out. <laughs> you know, because a picture is worth a thousand words. It really well, is. Sometimes people need to experience it for themselves to get the, the, or as Scientology would say, they need that reality factor, right, Tori? <laughs> yeah. Oh, God, is it true or what? But the other thing I wanted to mention here, if I can, is the difference. Because everyone, like Leah mostly interviews people that were in the Sea Org, Leah and Mike. 
And so people kind of think everyone was in the Sea Org. But that's not true. It's a very small percentage of Scientology that are in the Sea Org. And they, their stories are vital and they're very important because they were the people running the church. But there also was a huge amount of people who were public. And I told you that story about me in the Wallersheim trial. Do you want me to tell that now or yeah. not? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, so this is just shows you how crazy the public are even. I mean, not everybody, but I had, they had already gotten me helping them in different legal issues. So I was a public, but I sort of had a Sea Org mindset. I'll say and that. Let me just, and let me just explain for the listeners that the largest number of Scientologists are what are called publics. These are people that are taking the courses and doing the auditing, but they don't work for the Church of Scientology. Right. Then there's another group of people called staff, and they operate the local facilities, and they tend to sign two and a half or five year contracts. And they get paid minimum wage if they get paid anything. And then there is the C Org, the C organization. And that's the most hardcore inner elite. You literally have to sign a billion year contract to become a C Org member. And then once you do, you work 365 days a year, you know, like virtually no sleep for $50 a week max. Many weeks you don't get paid at all. And these people live on bases. They live in communal housing. They're like the monks of Scientology, but it's even more hardcore than that. So when 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 uh, Tori is saying the word Publix, she's talking about Scientologists who don't work for the church. But that doesn't mean they're not dedicated. That doesn't mean they're not completely consumed by it, right? Right. Right. And and then and then so then the other part of the background is that. Uh, a few times Scientologists have left and then sued the church um, for various things. But Larry Wallersheim in particular was interesting because uh, he was suing because the, the technology itself had harmed him, he claimed. That right. Scientology itself was harmful. And so it became a big lawsuit in California, in Los Angeles in the 1980s. And... Um, Scientology was very worried about it, and so it was asking its publics, like Tory, to help them do something about it. And that's kind of the setup for what you're going to tell us. Right. Thank you. Okay. So, so there, and and people often say, why would anybody join like a a billion year contract? But you have to understand, they have a, their whole their whole side of it that's different than what we're saying, which is like it's so wonderful, and you'll work full time helping mankind, and blah blah blah. You know, so it has a whole rosy side to it where you think, okay. That sounds great. And I, I even joined the Sea Org, but they routed me out because I have epilepsy. It made me get off my medicine saying, we're the top 10% of the planet. We don't take medicine. Some 18-year-old kid and put me on a program. Anyway, long story short, I my mother made me get back on my medicine and I, I was out of the Sea Org. But now roll forward on it's in the 80s and Larry Wallersheim is suing the Church of Scientology and they're asking the public to go down there and march around the, the courthouse where you were, Tony, yep. with you know literally hundreds and hundreds of people marching around going, not one thin dime for Wallersheim, right? And yep. we're all screaming that I wasn't because I had I wanted to be in the courtroom. I knew Larry and I thought I want to be in the courtroom. I want to be firsthand on this. And Yachty was helping get that organized. And you had to be OT7, which was second to the top level. And I was only OT3. So I said to Bill, come on, help me get me in just for one day. And so he said, OK, go in for one day. So I knew I had to do something to make me valuable enough that they would want to keep me in the courtroom, right? So I thought of this all by myself. They didn't tell me to do it. They didn't think of it. I thought of it. But I labeled all the jurors, you know, 1 through 20 or whatever. And then whenever either attorney would ask a question, I would write down what their what their responses were. They're not nodding yes. They're nodding no. Some of them fell asleep. They were playing tic-tac-toe, you know, just like different things. I, I had all this stuff written down. Okay, so now the first day ends and I come outside and these guys come up to me and they go, 
we're with the investigation and we need your notes. And I said, okay, because I thought, good, that, that's good. They want my notes. So they take my notes and the next day they come up to me and they say, okay, we want you in the courtroom every single day doing exactly that. So I was there for the whole thing and I ended up standing up twice in the courtroom speaking out. One time, Larry started getting into OT3 and this was way before Xenu and OT3 was public at all. It was all top secret. And they really didn't want it in the court transcripts. So the president of the Church of Scientology came up to me, Ken Hoden at the time, and he said, look, I don't care what you do, just handle this. And all the executives, were, and a lot of the executives were there at the time. And he said, just handle it so that the, that you know none of the OT3 stuff gets into the courtroom. So now he starts talking about he's having these dreams and this and that. And I think, uh oh, this is it. He's going to go into OT3. So I raise my hand and 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 the, and I, I stand up and I say, I need to say something. And Wallersheim's attorney says, she can't talk. She can't talk. And he throws his arms out like wide. She can't talk. And I think and the and the judge says, you know, I just imagine it's the judge the attorney and I'm on behind the attorney and the judge points out and he goes, you sit down. And I think, Oh God, he's talking to me. And I'm not a person who faints, but I almost fainted. And I, and I'm just standing there and he, and he goes, and he says to the attorney, you sit down. He says, she might have something important to say. And he says to the jury, I want everyone to leave the room. And they all left. And he goes, okay, what do you want to say? And I said, look, you promised, because he did, that he wouldn't let the OT3 material get into the, the courtroom. And I said, but Larry's starting to roll into it. I can tell. And he looks at me and he says, well, why didn't Mr. Cooley say anything? Who was the attorney for the church? The, right. Yeah, the attorney for the church. And again, I don't faint, but I almost fainted. I mean, I was just like, oh, God, this is awful. But then I, I, I'm really good in emergency situations. And I just thought, OK, that's it. You know, get rid of that. Handle it. And so I just looked at him and I said, well, I'm just going to tell you the truth, which is that's why to me, truth is on my side all the time. And so I looked at him and I said, I'm just going to tell you the truth. I did OT3. Mr. Cooley did not. And at that point, all these executives that had just been sitting there all jumped up and they're, I'm OT3, I'm OT3, I'm OT3. You know, so it was, it ended up, Bill Yachty brought me the transcript from that courtroom. And in OT8, to get onto it, you have to do something monumental that helps the church. And he brought the transcript and he goes, here's your OT8. <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, well, that, it's highly it's highly irregular for the judge to have allowed you to do that, but oh uh, yeah. Eventually, what happened was um, he won. I mean, this this does come up occasionally. The first person to actually mention Zenu in public in print was Robert Kaufman in his book, his nineteen seventy two book, Inside Scientology, but nobody read it. So it didn't make it didn't it didn't make any kind of an impact. Right. Um, uh, Richard Leiby, when he was at the Clearwater Sun in eighty or eighty one, yeah. talked about Xenu. But again, Clearwater Sun's not going to be well known in Los Angeles or anything like that. It wasn't until that trial, when the OT three materials were entered as a, a document. That I remember reading that the Scientology made sure there was a line of Scientologists at the court to check out those materials continually. Right. They, so we had LA, to on the boxes. Right. And but at some point, an L.A. Times reporter managed to get there early or late or whatever and finally did manage to check out that box. Oh. And the L.A. Times then published the Xenu story. Right. In like 84, 85, something like that. And that's the right. one that kind of spread it. Of course, right. everyone cites South Park in 2005. But um, 
you know, you got to credit Richard Leiby and at the Clearwater Sun and then the reporters at the LA Times because they were really there before that. But uh, yeah, amazing. So the jury did decide, you know, they did uh, fine for Larry and award him more than $30 million. But eventually that got reduced on appeal. And then it took Scientology so long to pay him because, as you said, they wanted to pay, they never wanted to pay one thin dime to Wolfersheim. That in 2002, when they had finally run out of their appeals, um, the interest on what they did owe him was up to nine million dollars. And in in 2002, they finally just wrote him a check to end it. So they did pay a lot of dimes to Wolfersheim in the end. Exactly. And I went down to the Shrine Auditorium then, and I had my sign, you know, not one thin dime for Wallersheim. And then I turned it around and it said, Larry Wallersheim, $8 million. <laughs> <laughs> and I have another story. You can edit this out if it's too long, but I have to tell it, Tony, because it's really an important story. Speaking of Richard Leiby, this, yeah. I... We moved from L.A. to Clearwater in 1979. And at the time, I had never, I always wondered how the Germans, how Hitler got all those people to, you know, march around and be against the Jewish people and do all the horrible things that he did. Okay, so now we moved to Clearwater and here's all these people marching around the Church of Scientology, screaming their lungs out with picket signs and everything and they're all like you know honk out scientology stamp out scientology save sparkling clear water stamp out scientology right and i'm like what is this right freaked me out okay so milt wolf who was part of the guardian's office whole nother story but anyway there were the earlier office of special affairs and they did a lot of stuff he called me into his office and he said look you've got to handle this and i said what are you talking about? I'm a brand new mom. I have my my son is under two years old. How can I possibly handle all these people by myself? And he said, there's only four public that live in Clearwater at the time. And he said, you're one of them. And you're going to go out and handle this. And I said, <laughs> I felt like, are you kidding me? But then I thought, okay, I'll do it. So I go out and I find this older woman who's a grandmother. And I say, look, what are you doing? Look at my son. He's crying his lives out because all these people are honking out Scientology, screaming, yelling. I said, you're a grandmother. You should put down your flags and go home. And she did. She left. And that I thought, OK, there's one. And anyway, long story <laughs> short, I started handling person by person, meeting by meeting. And I finally, finally, Milt said, look, just go join Save Sparkling Clearwater because Richard Tenney was running for city commissioner. Mm -hmm. Richard, Le Richard Leiby, as you mentioned, was the, the journalist there that, that was, you know, telling all kinds of stuff, but nothing about Scientology. He was sort of just reporting. And uh, Richard Tenney was running for city commissioner and they didn't want him to get it. So we joined, he had a thing, Save Sparkling Clearwater, Stamp Out Scientology. So we joined Save Sparkling Clearwater, Stamp Out Scientology. Tenny shows up and I say, what are you doing? You're my city commissioner. And he says, I'm not your city commissioner. And I say, you're going to say in front of Richard Leiby, that a journalist, that you, because of my religion, are not my city commissioner. And he goes, that's correct. And so that... And Richard Leiby is like writing away. And I knew he wrote all kinds of stuff. And, I, and I've and i never hit anyone in my life. But he, I'm kind of, I'm 5'7", and he was kind of a shorter guy. And I said, look, if you ever, I, I took his notebook out of his hands. And I said, if you ever write anything about me that isn't true in your newspaper, I'm going to personally come to your house. So he, he never wrote anything about me at all. <laughs> but anyway, I we ended up, going to all their meetings, blah, blah, blah. But that was the beginning of me helping the office of special affairs because he ended up getting voted out of office. So I went from zero as far as OSA to call Tori. She can handle anything, right? So that was that was the beginning of it. And I don't know if you knew that, so I wanted to tell you. Well, were you still in Clearwater in 1982? Yeah. So you were there when the hearings happened? 
Well, I wasn't. We moved back to L.A. We were there from 79 to 82, and then we moved back to L.A. Okay, because the hearings happened in May 82, I believe. No, no, no. I think we'd already moved back. All right, but because the reason, the, the reason why, if you got there in 79, the reason why there, were pick, there was picketing going on was that, that that was right when the FBI documents had finally started coming out. And the people of Clearwater had, for the first time, become aware of things like the plot against Mayor Gabe, Gabe Casares, right, and the, the plots to infiltrate the newspaper, and all these really amazing documents had come out showing that Scientology was basically operating like an international espionage uh, organization right. and like a mafia, and that they were trying to destroy people. And so, from seventy nine to eighty two. Clearwater was up in arms about them and right. really wanted, and, and so you happened to move there right in that period. And then in 82, May 80, I think it was May 82, I might be wrong. They had these hearings, like these commissioners had hearings and brought in people like uh, Nibs and right. Paulette, Paulette Cooper right, and uh, other people that came in and gave really interesting testimony about what Scientology was up to. Um, but so, but you think you were gone by then, huh? Well, what the other earlier thing that I don't know if you know, but I know the people on the bunker have written about it, um, is that what Milt got me to do it because I was like, why doesn't the Sea Org handle this shit? You know, why why are you asking me, a public, to handle it? And he said, okay, I'm going to tell you something that's top secret. You can't tell anyone, but here's the deal: L. Ron Hubbard's been out on the ocean, as we knew, on in the Apollo for years, right? Kind of basically hiding from the government, but. I didn't know that at the time. And he said he decided to come on land in Georgia. And so the, the Apollo was coming up to Georgia and they got word that the FBI was there and they were going to plant drugs on the ship. So L. Ron Hubbard circled around, bought the, the Fort Harrison, which is the, the big hotel in Clearwater, under a false name. They were the church of something else. It was another name, but they didn't say they were Scientologists. They lied and they said they were this other church. So that's why he said, we can't handle it because Richard Tenney's whole concept is don't trust them. They're liars. And he said, Tori, we are liars. We did lie. That's what happened. So that's why we can't handle it. We can't go out there and handle it because we did lie to them. That's what happened. So I, he said, you need to handle it as far as, you know, our religion, quote unquote, and that they're, he's trying to stop free speech and stuff like that. So that's what I went on. But well, anyway, it is, that's it the, is amazing if you go back into that history and see how that all went down. Yeah, in 74, Hubbard yeah. had taken the sea in 67, and I, I'm pretty sure he was sick and tired of it and his health wasn't good. And so in 74, they crossed the Atlantic and he wanted to come to shore and they were going to land like you said, somewhere in, in Georgia, and there were federal agents waiting for him. That's true. Uh -huh. The planting drugs I, is a short story, obviously, but uh, they, they, they were there because you know they were there to take him into custody or at least search the ship, whatever. So he <laughs> then uh, they decided not to land there, and then spent another year at sea, but in the Caribbean. Right. And then it wasn't until seventy five, uh, with the ship in, uh, uh, docked in the Bahamas that he then had people come to Daytona in Florida as they began to surreptitiously take over Clearwater. They had bought the Fort Harrison uh, Hotel and, and the Clearwater Bank building under the name the United Churches of Florida. There you I go. But see, you show, it shows how covert they are. It's incredible. And, and that's how they've always operated. That's how they operate today. Have right. you had much uh, harassment these days, Tori? All the time, but it's always little stuff that there's no, you know, I early on went to the Burbank Police Department and I said, here's the deal. You know, I explained fair game and I said, look, you know, there's nothing that I can report to you that, you know, is like a real thing because they don't do anything big enough that would, would, you know, you know, merit me calling you. But I'm going to make a physical report. Every time they do something, I'm going to report it. So there's a paper trail. So you kind of get 
where they're at. And they said, okay, deal. So I have. Every time they do little shit, it doesn't matter. I make a little report and get it to the Burbank police. So they know who they are and they understand how bad they are. Because that's the thing. Just like I feel bad for the jurors with Danny Masterson because they, how can they possibly understand how, how, I mean, listen to what we've talked about. This is a church, supposedly. People hear church and I say, believe me, it is not, it really, we call it the soul sucking, mind control business pretending to be a religion. That's really what it is. Well, you know what? Um, and that organization in its files, no doubt, has a record that you and I and Spanky Taylor had a nice dinner <laughs> at an Italian restaurant in Los Feliz. And then, then we <laughs> followed it up with a slice of pie at the House of Pies. <laughs> Wasn't that nice? It was so great to see you, Tony. And we had so much fun. We really did. Well, hopefully I'll be coming out in the spring for round two. And uh, you can bet that if I am out there again, I will see you again, Tori, because I love All getting together right. with you. Okay, well, thank you for everything you do. I love you tons, and I love the bunker, and just really everyone around the world that has helped expose the abuses of the Church of Scientology because they're deep and they're covert, like I'm saying, and uh, it's important that people know. All right, well, tell please wish all of the wonderful people in the bunker a Merry Christmas, will you? Merry Christmas to everyone and happy holidays, happy Hanukkah, happy everything. Have a wonderful holiday. Thank and you so much, Tori. Talk yeah, to you soon. Thank you. Thank you Sorry. very much. Bye bye. Now I'm bunker down in bunker town again, again, again. To witness history, ride the storm, wait to see how reckoning.